Hey, you're listening to a Bible Rodan podcast, where brothers come together to sharpen one another so we can rightly divide the Word of God. I'm Matt. And this is Billy. And totally almost just said, I'm Billy. <laughs> <I don't know>. <laughs> <laughs> it's because you hear us, you know, you hear all the, because the, I'm sure you listen to our show for, you know, for training purposes. <laughs> because yeah, those well, two, I do listen to Those it, two guys I, are awesome. I learned so much from them. Because, <laughs> okay, oh, because we lose our minds and we forget what we say week to week. Yeah. <laughs> Man, that was a good point. I'm glad I made that. Okay, what were we talking about? What are we doing today? We're talking about irresistible grace. Sorry, we're back. Total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement. We've covered all three. And today we're going to look at the next point in TULIP, which is irresistible grace. And the first thing that we want to do, well, what you need to know up front is that irresistible grace, like limited atonement, is simply just a logical conclusion of the first two points. Actually, the first one. If everybody is born dead in trespasses and sins, they are born incapable of recognizing their their standing and before God and that they need to humble themselves and, and seek him. If they're incapable of doing that, then obviously the people who are saved have to be picked by God and they have to, they, it limits the atonement necessarily. Uh, and then you have irresistible grace, which is the how of unconditional election. How, how, is, how does unconditional election work? God gives them this un- irresistible grace to bring them to spiritual life. And really, so that leads to our next point, irresistible grace is probably better understood to be irresistible regeneration because g- grace is just not a specific word. <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, I listened to probably four different sermons on irresistible grace from Calvinist perspective just to, I've listened to a ton of them in the past, but I was just wanting to get all the, make sure we don't miss anything specific that they want to talk about and slam dunk verse or something like that. But in each one of those, they all throughout their evidences for irresistible grace continue to fall back on the, the three previous points as evidences in themselves. As I said last week, hopefully you listened to limited atonement, but do not start your conversation with a Calvinist here. If you're talking to someone, they, they want to convince you that Calvinism is the way to go, and you want to convince them that it's not, and you're going to do that whole thing, don't start here. It won't work. It won't work if you start with limited atonement. It really won't work if you start with unconditional election. You have to start at total depravity and understand what it is we inherited from Adam. Did we inherit a guilt from Adam, or did we inherit a world that is separate from God because of sin, and so now we are going to sin and inherit death, which is what Romans 5 says, you know, it, it, did we inherit, it, are we then incapable or are we capable? Those questions have to be answered first, because if we are capable of understanding God uh, uh, and acting on the, the revelation and the assurance of that revelation that he's given us, then you really don't need these other points. Uh, unconditional election doesn't have to be a thing. The atonement doesn't have to be limited. And uh, God doesn't have to irres- irresistibly bring someone to spiritual life for them to believe, which is just backwards in the first place we'll get there we'll get there yeah if, if you think about just you know when you build a house you have to start with the foundation and uh that's what you kind of have to do when you're discussing this with someone who who holds to reform theology or tulip and you can't if you if you start here they're gonna just fall back well that can't work because of of limited atonement well that can't work because of unconditional election well that, that can't work because of total depravity so just uh, get them to step back to total depravity and build your case up. Show them, you know, that there is a a way to interpret these passages and to see that it does build upon it upon each other. That all people are not totally depraved, where where they can't do, uh, they can't even recognize their own sin, um, and they can't, you know, humbly confess that Lord, I need you. Uh, that's that's not in Scripture. Uh, so just start there and build your way up to get them to see, oh, I, I can see your point of view. I can see how you build upon scripture and that's how you have to do it. Yep. So yep. do we define really what is ir- – I've heard many Calvinists call it the effectual call as well instead of irresistible grace. What are other mm-hmm. terms that you use as a Calvinist? Do you remember any other ones? No, I always uh, preferred – I mean I knew what irresistible grace meant. I always preferred regeneration. I mean it, it's, it's, that's the point of it. That's the heart of it. Yeah, uh, where effectual call. That's from uh 1647 Westminster Confession of Faith, yeah. correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh so that's more of your traditional way of of labeling it. To so for those of you who don't know Tulip is really just a, a cutesy way of remembering these points. They're not they didn't decide on T U L I P because they were the best names for these <laughs> these different things. <laughs> it's just a way to remember them. So 
Yeah, there there are better names for these. Like uh, like we said last time, limited atonement. There, uh, R.C. Sproul redefines it. Uh, unconditional election. Even some people change the name of it. It doesn't matter. It's the point behind it that matters. So, effectual call, irresistible generation, whatever you want to call it. The grace is that God is doing something to your nature that causes you to want to seek Him. So it's it's a it's a um, uh, compatibilistic, right? It's His will. We're, manipulating in a way your will i know calvinists don't like the word manipulation that's what's happening sorry uh it's a manipulation of your nature so that you will want the things that he wants yeah the to to say oh well you know you're you're uh for a non-calvinist to tell a calvinist oh well your god is just like making people kick and scream coming to them and, and they would say no that's not what we believe we believe god is changing your nature and now you will want to believe so they're not they're not changing your your will he's actually giving you the will so you can come to him Right, and I told Billy earlier. So this is, uh, I've been, I've been, I've been catching up on my Walking Dead. I skipped it for the last couple of years and uh, <laughs> started watching it again. And so uh, here's here's a uh, an analogy for you. Uh, irresistible grace uh, is if you were had a bunch of zombies in front of you. They're all dead. They can't they can't want anything but what zombies want, which is to eat you, because that's what zombies do. They like brains. And uh, you have this this dart gun, right, that has a serum in it. And if you shoot one of the zombies. They change back into a person, and that person then no longer wants to eat your brains because that's that's he's not a zombie anymore. That's not his nature. Instead, he wants healthy things like peanut butter and jelly and pizza and ice cream. That those are healthy, right? So, and, and you know, to change your little <laughs> zombies want flesh, right? And now yeah. you're going to change it so they want not only can they still eat flesh, but they can also want vegetables and candy and ice cream and all that other stuff. Yeah, they will be repulsed by the fle- by flesh. They they won't <laughs> want it, right? So, and and to take it a little further, uh, you haven't heard this part, Billy. It, let's say you had a hundred zombies in front of you, and you had a dart gun with just infinite darts that have the the cure in them. Uh, but you only decide to shoot ten of them, and you you pull those ten out, and you've unconditionally elected for your own reasons to 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 turn those ten into creatures that would want to get out of this zombie whatever, and so. That's basically what Calvinism is doing. You have the the ability to save the rest of them. You could, but you're not. They're, they're dead. Their 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 thing is to be dead and eat brains, and you're against that. And so you're gonna just punish them for being the way they are, and you're not gonna do anything to help them, even though you could. And so, yeah, zombies, irresistible grace. That's what it's all about. <laughs> <laughs> so ultimately, the effectual call to a sinner or irresistible grace uh, overwhelms a a a sinner, a totally depraved person's natural inclination to rebel so that he is willingly placing his faith in the Lord. Mm-hmm. Yep, and they will stress that. It is not, uh, you, you said it earlier, it's, it's not him causing them to do it, or, or no, let's say it's not them, God forcing a, an unrepentant non-believer to believe in him. It's God repro- reprogramming that person so that they want to believe in him. And this this, oh, this used to drive me crazy. If there's a Calvinist listen to this, it's probably driving you crazy. Uh, this whole reprogramming language, the, this idea that uh, Calvinists uh, believe in that we're all robots. Man, Billy used to throw that at me all the time, and I hated it. <laughs> but that's really, uh, honestly, that is the best analogy, is that what we're saying, what Calvinists are saying, is that people are like robots, and God just goes in and reprograms them a little bit, so that now he's not forcing them to do anything they don't want to do. He's just changing the things that they want to do. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's kind of like uh, an AI that you, you program to be able to think and do various math equations, but you make it so it can't add 1 plus 1. That's the only thing it can't do. It, it's imp- it's not in the programming. It can't do 1 plus 1. It can, so it has free to, freedom to do whatever math problem it wants, but it can't do 1 plus 1. And you change <laughs> one line of code. <laughs> and now and it can all of do. a sudden, yes. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's take a look at some of the some of the passages that people use to prove this and there are some that are just goofy let's get back to the the idea of grace because i think there's some common agreement on 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 this part between the two camps you know grace is is that unmerited favor it's it's uh god well not not necessarily god it could be anyone you know granting you favor that's not deserved really so let me ask you this though because i i you know this it's been a pet peeve of mine for a while let's say you walk by someone on the side of the street and he's begging for money and you're telling me this story after the fact and you you tell me yeah i walked by this guy and i gave him grace and i kept going i don't really know what that means right i mean did you give him money did you smile at him did you like pat him on the back be like good luck bud 
Did you give him a shirt? Did you take him to a shelter? Grace has substance. You can't just say grace <laughs> and expect us to know what you're talking about. And and this is a I'm picking this bone with uh, both Calvinists and Arminians, right? Irresistible grace doesn't is doesn't tell us what's happening. That's why we renamed it, you know, irresistible rejuvenation. Uh, Arminians with your uh, prevenient grace. What what is that? We, <laughs> that's not in the Bible. What what is this thing that's out there that God is doing? Can you you know define it for us? And I believe we have. That's is His witness and. As we, if you haven't seen, Bible Rodan has a new study up. We believe that God also places faith in us. He, he, he gives us the divine assurance and, and, uh, uh, persuasion by which we can act. So that, that is his grace. That is what is provenient. He's giving everybody that. But, uh, grace by itself is just, as Billy said, unmerited favor. It's just something you're given. What it is, you have to be specific about. Yeah. I mean, I think we would all agree that, that there's all sorts of, of grace that we're under from God, every single person, the Calvinist and the non-Calvinist. You know, when, uh, for instance, when God sovereignly chose <laughs> to unconditionally free and purchase and buy and redeem and uh, remove from bondage all of Israel from Egypt, that was unconditional. That was unmerited. They didn't deserve that. They were as, as filthy and nasty and, and despising as all the Egyptians, but God did it to them anyway. Yeah, even something as simple as it rains on the just and the mm-hmm. unjust. Uh, that rain in that passage is actually a good thing. It's talking about, you know, people are growing stuff, and so they need rain to actually grow their crops. And who, who gets the rain? Well, everybody gets the rain, so that's a grace from God. The fact that you woke up, <laughs> grace from God. Yeah, everybody experiences God's grace in some manner. So, which which leads us, Billy, I think, uh, pretty pretty solidly. It's a good segue into the fact that everybody is given God's grace, um, and he just gives his elect special grace, right? Oh, special grace. Is that like special favor? Uh Uh-huh. Special calling, special grace. Is special special favor favor synonymous with favoritism? Define favoritism. (laughs) 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 We would suggest that you go back. Where is that at? We have a study or a podcast on favoritism that we did recently. Yeah, is God biased? Does he play favorites? Scripture's clear. He's unbiased. He he does not treat people in uh, he doesn't words right <laughs> they're supposed to be podcasters uh he treats people equally and it is based on their decisions their actions that causes him to place them in one category or another elect non elect so episode twenty nine twenty nine there it is right which is this the so when you go back because we're going to go over this first text that Calvinists often use in order to talk about this this effectual call uh, mm-hmm. which is John six. Um, so John 6, if you want to go back, is episode 28 that we discussed this passage. And then right after that is episode 29, Does God Show Favoritism? And we also talked about it, I think, in the Total Depravity mm-hmm. episode, right? So yes. we, we've, we talk about this passage a lot because John 6 is just a popular Calvinist chapter. But specifically, we're talking uh, verse 44. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'll read it. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I'll raise him up on the last day. So who does who does Christ raise up on the last day? Those the Father has drawn. All right. So so Matt Calvinist, um, what does this mean? What are you trying to say? How is this irresistible grace? Well, the the word there for drawn is forceful, right? It, it, it talks. If you look up that word in Bible Hub and you look at the different instances that it's used in the New Testament, you'll see that it's it's someone dragged into court. It's it. It, there implies force, uh, even to, against a person's will, uh, to some extent. It is not a wooing or a request or anything like that. So the ones that the Father is drawing, he does so effectually from beginning to end. They are drawn all the way to Christ, and Christ will raise them up on the last day. I always found that interesting, that at one point they complain if you say you're, you're making someone uh, want you against their will. But then they turn to John 44 and say, draws like it's kicking and screaming against him. <laughs> you understand? See that? See well, that's it's, it's why it's called a, a Koine Greek. It's Little Greek. It's just the common language. But the, the understanding behind it is he's changing their nature so that they are unquestionably, without, without the ability to, <laughs> to rebel, drawn to Christ. Um, that's how he draws. So what, it's not what, like what, what verse really is that in this, in this chapter? It's, uh, that's, uh, it's down there in verse um, 72. <laughs> okay, just making sure. Okay, there is no seventy-two in John six. Those of you who don't have your Bible open. 
<laughs> yeah, it's interesting. They 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 uh, they they point to this that you know no one comes to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Christians believe this. Every Christian believes that no one can come to come to Christ unless the Father draws him. How does the Father draw him? By t- hearing and learning, by teaching them, and they shall all be taught of God. Yeah, yeah, they shall. I mean, literally says right after that, and they shall all be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. So we have people who are hearing and learning. What if they just hear? Well, everybody hears, Billy, but people who are dead. I mean, dead means dead. You can't do anything when you're dead. Lazarus, when he was in the tomb, <laughs> did he did he get up and walk out by himself, Billy? <laughs> no. Jesus had to effectually call him and raise him to life and call him out of that tomb. And that's like us. We are in the tomb. We're laying there dead. And God has to call us out of that. He has to bring us to life so that we can leave the tomb. So, bam. <laughs> <laughs> that's the most oh, that analogy i've heard i heard it th- like twice today i mean valley of dry uh, yeah valley of dry bones mm-hmm. god's god's talking to prophet and says hey say to these bones wake up and that's that's like uh he, he gives them flesh and everything and he puts a heart in them and that's that's the unbeliever that was God was is was that to be a was that symbology there was that real or symbolic yes because <laughs> there's nothing in there that really talks about any, any kind of symbolism it, it's literally talking about all the dead and how they were bones in the ground Look, and and the spirit came into them and they literally regenerated their flesh and their eye sockets and their bones and became real and then god breathed into them again <laughs> whoa uh, yeah this that's talking about the end times when uh we're all resurrected to eternal life not all of us but those who literally trusted in god and then right. somehow it's been turned into this this uh, idea of of spiritual regeneration, the symbolic regeneration that we receive when we put trust in the Lord, uh, and that's not what Scripture says. This one here, again, everyone is is called, everyone is drawn by the Father. When you, when it, when let's if, let's look back at first of all, there's one other use in this word, this draw, where in John twelve, is that right? Yes, John twelve thirty two, where when Christ uh, uh, is lifted up on the cross, he will draw all men to himself. That's what I've heard is, well, yeah, but that's not really all men. That's just the elect to himself. That's how they have to change it because they want to keep what draw means. And they can't have, have Christ literally drawing all men because that's, that's obviously not happening. So they have to say he's drawing all the elect men to himself, right? But, or all types of men. Right, or all, <laughs> all types of men. Yeah. yeah. If we turn back to uh, Hosea, back in the Old Testament, we have something very similar. Hosea chapter 11, verses 1 to 5. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. As they called as they called them, so they went from them. They sacrificed to Baals and burned incense to carved images. I taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by their arms, but they did not know that I had healed them. I drew them with gentle cords, with bands of love, and I was to them as those who take the yoke from their neck. I stooped and fed them. He shall not return to the land of Egypt, but the Assyrian king will be shall be his king because they refuse to repent. So here we have this is in the Septuagint again, same people that <coughs> wrote the Old Testament uh, translated it into Greek around three hundred. Is that correct, mm-hmm. Matt? Yeah, it was in the interte- intertestamental yeah. period. But and I they translated it to that. Greek. And this same word here for I drew them with gentle cords is the same word that we have in John for both those passages. Um, and, and even, even if you were to look at the the Hebrew, the Hebrew actually has the same same meaning. It can be draw or drag. So I drew them with gentle cords. With how? How did he draw them? With bands of love. And I was to them as those who take the yoke from their neck. So this is speaking of, of Egypt, when God freed them and he purchased them and he, re- he removed the yoke of slavery from their neck. They were no longer in bondage. He drew them with love. Like, look at, look at what I'm doing for you. I love you. I've called to you. But yet, did that drawing mean that they all trusted him? No, they refused to repent. Well, I mean, these are the elect. The the ones who would have, or the ones who would have submitted to that would be the elect, and the ones who didn't obviously right, but are this not isn't, his. This remnant. isn't say I drew only those who I elected. It says I drew them all. <laughs> I relist all of them. No, Billy. Every time I see the word drew, I'm gonna understand that the people who do it were brought to spiritual life by God. In the first place. But it says, because they refuse to repent. So I drew, but because they refuse to repent. But you're taking it out of context. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll stop. I'll stop. I'll stop. Yeah, no. 
<laughs> so this is the kind of things that I used to argue, and, and other people have argued, and, and I didn't. I didn't actually take it that far. I, I was <laughs> smart enough not to just make random uh, claims like that. But uh, some communists do this. Uh, you know, we've experienced it online and other places. That once you start to make a point, they they call you a name, or they 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 say you're taking it out of context, and they go to another place to try and prove their presupposition that they're just forcing on that passage you were at just a minute ago. And don't let them do that. Nehemiah 9.30, however you bore, and that word for bore is that same word, Mashach, drew. So you drew them for many years and admonished them by your spirit through your prophets, yet they would not give ear. Therefore, you gave them into the hand of people of the lands. Same kind of thing. He was drawing them. He was through love, through doing works for them. Uh, he admonished them when they didn't listen to him, but yet they would not give ear. They They close off their ears to his drawing and they didn't they heard but they didn't learn they didn't trust they didn't walk okay so so serious serious question the however you you bore with them for many years and admonished them by your spirit through the prophets yet they would not give ear now is this talking about these people salvifically or is this could this be about god drawing uh, a nation to obedience, but not necessarily talking about them being saved or not. Uh, well, when you look at all the various contexts of what God did with Israel and Egypt, how he purchased, how he bought, how he redeemed, how it was through the Passover lamb, uh, those were all literal things. And yet God said that, and, and that he was trying to lead them all to the promised land. These all sound like pretty big concepts that we also see in the New Testament of, of eternal life and salvation and God purchasing and buying and, and redeeming all of us. Uh, and, and it says that despite all of this, I'm going in front of you. I'm offering you all of this stuff. I defeat your enemies for you. But in all of this, you did not trust in the Lord your God. So why didn't they receive the promised land? Not because he didn't do all these things for them, but because they did not trust in the Lord your God. That was a literal thing absolutely but it was also a shadow of, of everybody it's a shadow of I mean, the promised land as 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 abraham as speaks of abraham in, in hebrews he says that he, he he knew that the promise that god gave him that hey you will i'm going to give you all this land he wasn't looking for that land he was looking for the heavenly land the promised land the true the true meaning of, of the promise and and to add to that in reading uh, nehemiah nine thirty, it says and he god admonished them by your spirit through your prophets, yet they would not give ear. And if you consider the fact that the spirit is the spirit of truth, right? First John five, and that blasphemy of the spirit or, or ignoring his witness and calling him a liar is what condemns you. Then these people who are not giving ear to him, whether it was to go to a different land or to be a certain kind of kingdom or whatever, if they're suppressing the truth of the, of the spirit and they're calling him a liar, they are blaspheming him. And that is going to earn them condemnation. Yeah, this it was the same thing that uh, Stephen said in, in Acts chapter 7, you know, about salvation in the Old Testament. He said, you know, he was preaching the gospel to them, saying, trust in the Lord. But he says, you men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did or your ancestors did. That's the same thing that we see in Nehemiah, that, that, that was the Spirit who was trying to teach them and, and lead them to the promised land. But they resisted, they rejected, they hardened. Yep, let me read this one. Jeremiah 31, 3. The Lord appeared to him from afar, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have drawn you with loving kindness and ropes and other hard stuff. No, <laughs> just loving kindness. Uh, and similarly, Romans 2, 4. Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? It's kind of this uh, schoolmaster, this tutor language, right? The, the law of God, the kindness of God leads you to repentance, the, the law is meant to lead you to the gospel. He's drawing with loving kindness. And he gave us the perfect example of his love when he, he, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Yep. Let me ask you this. Can, can it, it, this is a general question about grace, any kind of grace, it, whatever you, you want to specifically use. Can grace in general be resisted? Uh, I don't think the term resisted applies to grace. I think... Uh, Can it be ignored or given up or rejected? Yeah, it, it, get, it goes back to you have to define what, what the grace is. If if I'm gracious and uh, give you $100, right? I'm, I, I'm being gracious regardless of, 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 of your end what of I the bargain. What I do with it. I'm being gracious in giving you $100. Now you can so take I can drop it on the ground. Yeah, you can take that. You can refuse <laughs> to accept it. You can just ignore me. You can walk away. 
but I am being gracious regardless of your response. Is there, and and, because I couldn't think of one, is there any kind of grace you can think of that cannot be rejected? Like I was thinking, God gives us life, but you know, you could kill yourself, which don't do that. <laughs> uh, yeah, he, 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 I think it's gracious that he enlightens every man. I think it's gracious that he's uh, presently passing over our sins and not throwing us all into hell. That one, his patience. You're right. That that was yeah. it, it, that he's that he's he enlightens all men. We just, we can suppress that. So that's that's a rejection of that enlightenment. Right. Um, but it's, but I mean, it, his it, patience. We, we all have it. We have to, as as Roman says, we have to suppress it and harden our hearts to get rid of it. Yeah. But the point is, over and over, the warnings uh, and, and the the, ple- the 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 pleas and the the <laughs> the apostles imploring us to to make sure that we don't harden ourselves, that we continue in the faith that we've received, and all that stuff seems very clearly to be pointing out that we can resist that grace. Mm-hmm. We can reject yeah. what he's offered. We can reject. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and over and over in the Old Testament, um, Billy only put a couple of verses in here. Guarantee he could put 30 more <laughs> pretty quickly. <laughs> uh, so let's look at a, a few more Calvinist texts. Philippians 2.13, uh, it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. I used to have a problem with that. That was hard. How do you answer that? God is the one who wills in you to will and to work for his good pleasure or his purpose. Well, I mean, if he's if he's in you doing it, then how is it? How, you can't take credit, right? If he's in you doing what? Causing you to work. I mean, this sounds like what we were saying about the robots. <laughs> God is is putting some kind of programming in you so that you will to act a certain way that that he wants you to. How is this not confirmation of of him? manipulating our will so that we desire what he desires he absolutely is persuading us to do his will and to work in that will now if you think about (laughs) if you think about every single person on earth who has a conscience and the law written on their hearts that's god in them giving them the, the the will and the persuasion not to do bad things when when your conscience is telling you after you you know steal the candy from the cookie jar when you were told not to, that's that's the Holy Spirit convicting you of sin, righteousness, and judgment. That's God working in you to will and to act in order to fill His good purpose. Gotcha. I mean, what that passage there that this specifically in, in uh, Philippians two thirteen is is actually talking to Christians, and of course God is going to be working in a Christian to, so that they they will want to do His will. You know, uh, what's some of the passages that talk about? Grow in the grow in the grace and knowledge. Uh, be tra- be transformed by the renewing of your mind. God is 12, yeah. the, He's giving you the spirit of truth to teach you and lead you and, and to do His will. I mean, that's that's Him trying to persuade you to to follow Him and to sow to Him and to to walk in Him and all for His purposes. But we can also see stepping back that this is also something given to every unbeliever. He wants you to follow him. He wants you to trust in him. He wants you to fulfill his purpose in you. His purpose from the day you were born was to seek him and to walk by faith. And I almost wish we had done, we had stopped to look for a little bit and done faith and then come back to this because it, it ties in so well with mm-hmm. this passage. Absolutely. So stay tuned. Hey, if you're not in our in the uh, Facebook group, Bible Rowdown, uh, join it. We are going to eventually, in the next couple of weeks, hopefully, have a Google Hangout where we're just going to talk through some stuff. We want to talk specifically about that faith study that's on the Bible Rowdown page right now, uh, BibleRowdown.com. It crosses that that Calvinist, non-Calvinist line. It's not, you know, we're not taking a tra- traditional non-Calvinist stance. We're agreeing with them. God gives us faith. And we want to talk through that with some of you that are uh, interested in doing that and, and kind of get your questions and, and responses and then do that before we have the episode because we want to make sure we cover everything but it's uh it's super important and it really exposes some of the things that even recently like if philippians two thirteen, i would have read that is god who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good pleasure or a good purpose i would explain that differently three weeks ago than i would today now I have no problem understanding that the work that he's doing is not just his knowledge, but is also the assurance or the persuasion of that knowledge, the pistis, the faith that he places in you so that you can do those things. Uh, yeah, go check that out. Yeah. Hit the, hit the it's, so, it's so simple. I mean, read the study. When, mm-hmm. when, when the Holy Spirit is convicting you of sin, what's the purpose? Repentance. Right. It's so you will, he's persuading your will so you will act. Right, as as yeah. as uh, we're gonna read later about sorrow leading to repentance. God is in you, giving you godly sorrow over your sin. Why? So that you can repent and go on to eternal life. 
that's the purpose. And and kind of to tie this back to Irresistible Grace and him, you know, you can't, it's irresistible. That's in the that's in the name. God, what we're describing is something God gives everybody. Romans 1, right? He His wrath is against those who have suppressed the truth. The things that he has made known to them, they're evident to these people. They are suppressing. They are not honoring him and giving him thanks. And and that that passage alone proves to us that it can be suppressed. It is not irresistible. It's completely resistible. God gives everybody grace, but you can resist it to the point that he turns you over to your flesh. So, you want to go Acts 16? Sure. This is another one that, that's often brought up in this idea. Um, I heard John MacArthur say this is one of his is one of his favorite passages, and it's talking about a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening, and the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. A worshiper? God opened her heart. Sounds a lot like Acts 13, right? Mm-hmm. The, those who were appointed to eternal life believed the things that Paul and Barnabas were teaching. Mm-hmm. So he's, he's granting them the ability that he's bringing them to spiritual life after, wait, after they believed. How does that work? He, they believed, and then he regenerated them irresistibly so that they could believe some more, right? Yeah. It's so confusing of, trying to figure that out from a Calvinist perspective. It's, <laughs> it's just not right. Yeah, this she was a worshiper of God. She was one who had heard and learned from the Father. And so when when Paul came and was telling her about Christ and the Son and what he did on the cross, God opened her heart and so he could reveal and persuade her to trust and believe in what Paul was saying. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I mean, she was a believer of God. This goes back to, uh, is it Matthew 13? Parable of the Sower? Right after that. Right after the parable uh, of the sower, and the disciples came to him, came to Jesus. Said, Why do you speak to them in parables? Jesus answered them, oh, yeah. To you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted. Forever, for, for whoever has, to him more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from him. Hmm. Oh, get out of town. That is the exact same phrase that's used in Matthew 23. Mm-hmm. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, when he's talking about uh, the parable of the wicked servant. He gives his servants, uh, a master is leaving, and he gives his servants different talents, different different amounts of money to do with uh, as they will. It's Matthew 25. And, but yeah. 25, sorry. And and two of them do, do whatever they do to, to produce more talents for the master when he returns. And then one of them buries it in the ground because he's afraid of the master and he doesn't really, you know, <laughs> want to do anything for him. And at the end, exact same phrase. For to everyone who has, more shall be given and he will have an abundance. But for the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. Throw out the worthless save to outer darkness. In that place will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Yeah, and when you, when you look at the, the idea here in Matthew 13, again, right after the parable of Sower, it says to, uh, that... Even what he has shall be taken away from him. Whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from him. So it sounds like, well, he doesn't have anything, but what he has will be taken away from him. So he does have something. Well, what what do we have? Well, in the first parable of the, uh, in the first the first soil, it says, this is the one on whom the seed had been sown beside the road. So he had the seed, the one on whom the seed was sown on the rocky places. Sorry, I skipped one. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. So he had the word within his heart and he had the conviction of the word in his heart but he didn't receive it so what he had was taken away that's a grace right just to be clear absolutely god god sowing something into them that that'll benefit them grace what do they do with it they reject it it's taken right let's see let me read acts a couple of these verses he's acts 5 31 he's the one whom god exalted to his right hand as prince and savior to grant repentance to israel and forgiveness of sins Acts eleven eighteen. when they heard this, they quieted down and glorified God, saying, Well, then God has granted to the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. 2 Timothy two twenty five. With gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of truth. All of these sound to me like God is giving something to the Gentiles so that hopefully they will act on it. Not necessarily that he has picked out individual Gentiles before the foundation of the world that he is just going to drag out of that group. What do you say? Yeah. Before I answer that, uh, Acts six <laughs> sixteen fourteen with Lydia, and as Matt mentioned, the uh, appealed uh, appointed to a torn life, 
Uh, we've spoken on these as well. Episode 35 is Cornelius and Lydia. We talk about that. Episode 37 is uh, Acts 13, Appointed to Eternal Life. Those go into detail of, of what is transpiring here in the book of Acts. Uh, how these people are people who are actually following the Lord already, and God is revealing more of the gospel, more of his revelation, more grace to them. He's He's now putting them under the shepherd, his son, and that they're following him and believing in him. Um, so yeah, these these three passages were to grant repentance to Israel and the forgiveness of sins. Uh, and then the other one is to grant grant uh, to the Gentiles repentance. Uh, so all these things, it appears that God is granting granting repentance. He's he's enabling, he's making it possible for these people to have repentance. Doesn't mean that he's forcing. That's not what grant means. <laughs> so, if hey Matt, if if I give you a grant to go to school. Do you have to take it? Based on my financial position right now, I might. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but do you have to? <laughs> no, I don't have to. I can turn it down. Yeah, right. Not... God makes it possible. This goes back to you know how how will they how will you hear how will you believe unless you've heard how will you you know in Romans ten you have to hear you have to know in order to believe you have to be able to know to repent means to change your mind you have to be able to know what you need to change your mind from and to God is granting them he he's revealing he's witnessing what these people have to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it, that that flies in the face of of irresistible grace, which builds on that unconditional election and that that total depravity. Uh, that He is granting this to an entire group of people in the hopes that they will all repent and seek Him. Uh, versus the Calvinist perspective, which says God knows they're not going to; He is just going to irresistibly draw some of them out of that group. You have to read that perspective into those passages. It's not there clearly. If if uh, if I'm at a bar and uh, there's a woman there and she doesn't have any interest in me and I slip her a drug and it forces her to change her mind or causes her to change her mind, so now she wants to, by her own will, huh. follow me. Is that a gift? You're still going to jail. <laughs> That's not a gift. Did I just give her a wonderful gift? <laughs> no, definitely not. So let's take a look at, at some of the things that people can resist. What, what does the Bible say we can resist in, in examples where it actually happened? Uh, not just the Old Testament passages from earlier, but uh, New Testament as well. You want to read Matthew 22 or you want me to? I can read it. Matthew 22.10 because we know you have a problem with reading occasionally. So <laughs> I do. I just sometimes words. Uh, uh, Matthew 22.10, uh, 22 verses 1 to 10. This is uh, the parable of the wedding feast. Jesus spoke to them again in parables saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his sons. And he sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast, and they were unwilling to come. Again, he sent out other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatted livestock are all butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went on their way, one to his own farm, another to his business. And the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. But the king was enraged, and he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main highways, and as many as you find there, invite to the wedding feast. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all they found, both evil and good, and the wedding hall was filled with the dinner guests. Nowhere in that does it talk about the slaves taking ropes or anything to drag the guests to the dinner. Right. I feel like they could have made that more clear. Okay. Yeah, one one thing we need to point here is that uh, the reformed of the Calvinists will say that, and we're going to get into this, that this is that outward general call that goes to all people, but it's not an effectual call. It's just a general call that that doesn't have any power in it whatsoever. Yeah. And what I want to say is that th this is obviously speaking of, of the, the, the sovereign king, right, and, and the, who has a wedding feast for his son, speaking of God the Father and his son, Jesus Christ. And he sent out slaves saying, he sent out slaves to invite people, right? So were these servants that were inviting people, do they have no power whatsoever? Did, I mean, to me, are, who do you think these are in the, in the, in the parable, Matt? The servants? Right. The servants that go out. Angels. Uh, that's kind of what I think too, because there's other passages talk about, you know, angels and, and ministering. You, you might want to, one might, may argue, well, it could be prophets and I, we could agree. But we know from Scripture that both angels, angels are pretty supernatural and spiritual to me, and I'm not sure how how what they're doing is a is a outward call, not an inward call. The prophet spoke by the Holy Spirit of God, and I'm not sure how that's an outward call, not an inward call. Uh, and what happens? They were unwilling to come. Yep, unwilling. So, it was it was their desire not to go. They resisted that call. They did not arrive at the the feast that they could have. 
So he sends more. He, 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 he sends more and he even provides more information saying, I have done everything. The dinner's ready. There's oxen. There's, there's bacon. <laughs> right? There's bacon. You know, just trying to persuade them to come. But again, they paid no attention and went on their way. And the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. So does this mean that this sovereign king in this, in this parable was any less sovereign? No. Nope. In fact, it actually shows his sovereignty by saying, this is what I command you, come. They didn't. So being the sovereign king, he administered justice right after that, right? <laughs> he sent his armies to destroy those murderers and set their city on fire. <laughs> That's how he's sovereign. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so thinking about the servants who were going out, it could also be a way of talking about Christ, mm -hmm. uh, John 1. Right. Uh, there was the, the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. The servants just could be an analogy of the fact that Christ, uh, who is God, uh, the word, was able to reach out to every man and enlighten him. And then uh, just after that, it says that the, uh, he went to his own and they did not receive him. He, the ones that he enlightened that responded to him, they were given the right to become children of God. The ones who he enlightened that did not respond to him or that rejected him, uh, they are the ones that the king is going to go to his, their town and, and burn it down. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, the, they're the ones who, in the parable of the talent, took that light that they were given and just uh, hid it under a bushel. No. <laughs> and Yeah. So, yes, all these things can be... Uh, uh, Billy, is there any argument you can think of where the the light of the word... The light of the Son of God is not is is like weak or ineffectual in some way. I mean, it, it, he says those those who were eight, who believed became where he gave the right to become sons of God. So obviously, it was effectual for some. Mm -hmm. So is the difference really in the calling, or is the difference in the person? It seems to be the soil. It seems to be those who received him. It seems to be put on the person. Yeah. So then you have to back up and say, well, maybe God, and, and I was there at one point when we were discussing back a couple of years ago, uh, maybe God made people intrinsically different, right? The elect, possibly he, he placed something in them in some way so that they could believe the light, whereas other people couldn't. Because John 1, there's no, there's no evidence at all that God is providing light, but also uh, on doing something to the people to manipulate them to believe that it's completely foreign to this. And, and you can't jump forward to John six and say, well, it says it right here. And then go back to John one and try to prove it from that as you know, you can't do that. <laughs> so yeah, it, it's it, it, the fact whether or not there, there aren't different kinds of calls. God is calling everybody. He's drawing everybody to himself. Whether or not someone receives that is based on that person, that soil, that, that, yeah. Like Some said. people may, out there may take offense at this, <laughs> but about these two different calls, you know, which are the exact same words in Scripture, and and saying, well, if if this call has people not responding, then obviously it was just the outward call. But this one, this one, which doesn't even mention calling, that's that's the inward call. Uh, it's very similar to uh, <laughs> the the Perusa, the, the the coming of Christ, where there's this is goes to the pre-trib and the post-trib rapture, and and how. There, it's all the same words, all the perusa, the coming of Christ, and how, well, this perusa is, is the, the, the first coming, where he actually doesn't come all the way to the earth, he's just coming to get his, get, get the, the, the church and, and rapture them. And this one, this perusa, is seven years later, and that one, it's, it's the same thing that we see in that. It's, it's a misuse of, of scripture. Yeah, and, and uh, maybe this isn't the right place to, to, to make this point, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do it anyway. The idea that, that we have to be brought to spiritual life in order to receive or, or to, to accept the light that uh, God is giving is contrary to scripture simply because uh, we read in Romans 8.10. This is just a simple couple of verses that kind of prove this point. Romans 8.10, if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. Why is the spirit alive? Because of righteousness. How are we righteous? How does that happen? How do we get in Christ? You can jump on back to Romans 4 where he makes the point about how we become righteous, uh, 22 through 24. Therefore, it was also credited to him as righteousness, him being Abraham. Not uh, Now, not for his sake only was it 
written that it was credited to him, but for our sake also, to whom it will be credited, as though as those who believed in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. So how, how is it that we're credited with righteousness? Just like Abraham. He credits our, our faith, our belief, our response to his witness with righteousness. If we submit to him, if we honor him and thank, give him thanks, then we are righteous. And then we are, as Romans 8.10 says, our spirit is alive. So response first, righteousness next, we're credited with righteousness and then we are considered spiritually alive. Mm-hmm. It does not say that we are spiritually alive. There's You can't find it. There's nowhere that says you are spiritually alive, then you believe, and then you're credited with righteousness. That's totally off. It's backwards. Right. And again, this goes back to misunderstanding what death is, uh, spiritual death, and total depravity. It's just not a thing. This is one of the favorite passages that I've recently found, Isaiah 5, uh, verses 1 to 7. Let me sing now for my well-beloved a song of my beloved concerning his vineyard. My well-beloved had a vineyard on a fertile hill. He dug it all around, removed its stones, and planted it with the choicest vine. And he built a tower in the middle of it and also hewed out a wine vat in it. Then he expected it to produce good grapes, but it produced only worthless ones. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why, when I expected it to produce good grapes, did it produce worthless ones? So now let me tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and I will be it will be consumed. I will break down its wall, and it will be become trampled ground. I will lay it to waste. It will not be pruned or hoed, but briars and thorns will come up. I will also charge the clouds to rain, no rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his delightful plant. Thus he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. For righteousness, but behold, a cry of distress. For all those who study the New Testament a lot and know of these other parables like John 15 of the vine and the parable of the sower, all these things are intertwined and say the exact same thing. This is God himself saying, I did everything for you, Jerusalem. I chose you. I called you. I purchased you. I freed you. I offered to lead you to the promised land. What more was there for me to do to my vineyard that I had not done? I expected you to produce good grapes. I expected you to walk by faith and produce fruit, to abide in me, but you did not. You were worthless. And thus, and it's so interesting, I, when I was reading this this time, Matt, I I, <laughs> I don't know if you caught it too, it will not be pruned or hoed. John 15. Hmm. Wait, so, uh, where? Oh, I thought you were reading Isaiah. John 15. No, I, this, I am reading Isaiah, but it, oh, he oh, says, oh. I will lay it to waste. It will not be pruned. It's not producing. Oh yeah, anything, yeah, yeah. So it can't it, be pruned, right? <laughs> just like John fifteen, those branches that don't bear fruit that are in the vine, the Father takes away. It cuts off. Uh huh. He doesn't prune them because that's pointless. You only prune something that you want to bear more fruit. Which is what he says yeah. in John fifteen. I will prune it so it can produce more. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, interesting. So what more yeah. could it could could God have done? What other tools could he have used? I mean, I, I mean, obviously he forgot that he could have irresistibly or irrevocably or supernaturally regenerate them first and cause them to obey. And don't get us wrong. We absolutely agree that God could, if he desired, cause every single person on earth to fall on their knees and worship him. That's not what we're saying. <laughs> okay. but yeah, one day every every tongue will confess, every knee will bow, yes. right? But that's at the end, and that's that's before they're, they're judged and separated, the goats to one side, the sheep to the other. That's not saying, I mean, yeah, he can do it. This reminds me, I mean, this passage here, like, what more could I have done? It reminds me back in, in Deuteronomy where he's just freed them. The Lord go, the Lord your God goes before you, will himself fight on your behalf. This is when the Jews come up and they see all these giants in the, in the promised land. They're like, wah, you saved us, but you freed us. But these giants, what are we going to do? He's like, the Lord your God who goes before you will himself fight on your behalf, just as he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. And in the wilderness where you saw how the Lord your God carried you just as a man carries his son and all the way which you have walked until you came to this place. But for all this, you did not trust in the Lord your God. And what's he say right at the end of that? None of these men, this evil generation, whom I did all these things for more, I mean, what more could I have done, shall see the good land which I swore to give to your fathers. Yep. He, he makes it all, uh, all available. He, he lays before them life and death. And he says, choose life. And some of them did. Those were the remnant. Those are the ones that he's, he saves time after time, that remnant of faithful people. Mm-hmm. And some of them don't. Actually, most of them don't. 
And those are the ones that he, he allows to go off into captivity and die. I mean, that the, if you, if you don't see the shadow and substance, if you don't see, understand that Israel is a shadow of the world and the, 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 the substance is that God has been treating all of us like this, that he purchased everybody and he expects everybody to respond to him faithfully. Uh, but he's only going to save that, that remnant that is, that he puts in Christ. Yeah. I'd, I'd go back and listen to our episodes on the shadows. Yeah, go back and listen to Billy's episode from a couple weeks ago, the atonement through the Exodus. It, it's so clear. It, it's, it's a perfect picture and you don't get, <laughs> you, you can get some similarities. You know, you, there are, there are coincidences in life at sometimes. Not like this. <laughs> this is per- perfect imagery. You cannot, this is not an accident. This is God doing it on purpose. So can, can a person receive all sorts of grace from God and then reject it? Of course. You know what I just thought of, Billy? Hebrews 6. Talked about it last time. Mm-hmm. What What does the person in Hebrews 6 receive? Uh, for in the case of those who have once been enlightened. Okay, so this is, this is a grace from God. They've been enlightened. Mm-hmm. They've tasted the heavenly gift. They have been partakers of the Holy Spirit. They have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. There's like six things there that they have received from God. A patient, uh, I mean, a patron client situation going here. He is giving them things. He is being graceful to them. And what do they do? If then they fall away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance. They can fall away. So Yeah, I've heard many people just try to say that. Oh, that's all hypothetical. It could never happen. He wasn't saved. Or yeah, yeah, <laughs> hypothetical. Yeah. yeah. We'll get to that here in a little bit. There's some more of those just like that. But just give you some more calls. Isaiah 65, 12. I will destine you for the sword and all of you will bow down to the slaughter. Why? Because I called you, but you did not answer. I spoke, but you did not hear. It sounds like they heard, but they didn't learn. Isaiah 66, 4 says the same thing. I called, but no one answered. I spoke, but they did not listen. Jeremiah 17, uh, 7, 13. And now because you have done all these things, declares the Lord. And I spoke to you, rising up early and speaking, but you did not hear. And I called, but you did not answer. And again, this is this is just so heart wrenching to think that this is our Lord. Matthew twenty three thirty seven. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together, the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling. Yep, that is heartfelt sorrow because they were refusing and unwilling. Could the Lord cause them all? Yes, He could, but He doesn't. He wants you to willingly choose him. He does everything. He shows you all of his glory, all of his love, all of his power, all these things that he does for you. He, he is in front of you, leading you on the way. He's, he's, what more could he have done? That's the big picture. You're right. That's the big picture. And you compare that with the Calvinist understanding, misunderstanding, that God is somehow is, is bringing people to spiritual life prior to them believing and prior to them being credited with righteousness. It's not scriptural. It is simply not scriptural. What we're talking about a couple weeks ago, uh, or was it last week? John ten. We were talking about sheep in one of the mm-hmm. mini casts, and we pointed out the passage that talks about Christ having other sheep that are not of this flock, and He's going to go get them and bring them into the flock so that they have one shepherd and they are all His flock. Right. And Calvinists look at that and say, "Yeah, those sheep that aren't His flock are the elect that He hasn't gotten to get yet." The problem is the elect, it, what, what these people who aren't elect, or I'm excuse me, these people who are quote unquote elect, who are not yet in Christ, well, that flies in the face of Ephesians 1. These people may not be regenerate yet. How, how can you say they're sheep? Uh, sheep consistently are believers. And, and yet you're saying that, that they may not believe yet, but they're still sheep. That's, again, you're getting this whole idea, the, these concepts backwards. First, it is God giving us his witness and the faith or the conviction or the, 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 um, uh, what's the P word that I'm, I'm missing here? The persuasion to act on it. So we, we, we get his witness and then we are convicted to know it's true. We, he makes sure that we understand and are assured that it's true. Then we are expected to believe, uh, John six, right? Uh, the crowd says, Hey, Jesus, how do we get this bread of life you keep talking about? And Jesus tells him, This is the work of the Father that you believe in the one that he has sent. Was, so what, what do we do with this conviction, this assurance of the truth that, that the Holy Spirit is giving us? We believe. And then just like Abraham, our belief, we believe, and God credits us with righteousness. And then later in Romans 8, Paul, Paul explains, you, you are spiritually alive. Your, your spirit is alive because of righteousness. 
That is the order of Salutis. That is the order that it comes in. God first, giving you everything you ca- you need. What more could he do? You responding obediently. God giving you faith and bringing you to spiritual life. You are now in right standing with God. You are no longer spiritually dead because there's nothing, there's no sin between you and him anymore. The Calvinists don't have, <laughs> they, they, there's no good scriptural argument to refute that point. That that It's just not happening. Ezekiel 18, 31 to 32. This is what God expects, expects from us. Cast away from all of your transgressions which you have committed and make yourselves uh-huh. a new heart and a new spirit. For why will you die, O house of Israel? Why will you die? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, declares the Lord God. Therefore, repent and live. So how do they make themselves a new heart and a new spirit? Repent and live. Mm-hmm. Yep. And why are they dying? Be- because they're not. <laughs> they are, they are resisting what, what he's asking them to do. You know what? I, I don't, uh, we, we've kind of hit the rest of these notes already in one form or another. Yeah. I, I do want to, because we hear this question. I, I've heard it so often. The one right, uh, why did you believe and someone else didn't? I, how about this? Let's make that the mini cast. Okay. That way, um, that way we have a topic. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But yeah, also, we're right in an hour. I think I think we've made the point, um, Billy. If they want to disagree with us, if they want to ask us for clarification, because we, you know, we kind of bounced around on this one. But uh, our goal was to, at the same t- time, refute the Calvinist point, but also uh, show you what Scripture is actually saying. And yes, that kind of comes across kind of scattered, but we try to pull from a lot of Scripture. Um, so yeah, yeah where, where can they reach out to us for that? Yeah, we well, you can reach out at uh, at BibleBroDown dot com. Again, what goes along with many of these studies, um, we could spend so much going on on many of these passages that are, are used often in order to kind of build up this this doctrine, like John six, um, many of the the passages in Acts with Lydia. We, we reference those those episodes. Then we encourage you, if you're like, well, how do you how do you explain this? To go back and listen to those, where we spend a whole episode on on one passage or one verse or a couple of passages. Um, but yeah, you can go to our studies page. We also have um, many of these written. Uh, mm-hmm. as studies that you can look and follow along that way if you're if you're one who likes to, to learn by reading or again if you want to learn by by listening you can go download the podcast uh, you can also email us at bible at gmail.com if you have any specific questions or comments or concerns or you want to refute something that we said uh, we'll be happy to hear it and happy to talk to you um, just do it in patience and love because that's what we're going to treat you with and that's it I think, uh, oh, hey, I do want a special prayer request. So we've had a couple hurricanes blow through. No fun. Uh, we also have some brothers and sisters out in the, I think, California yes. area dealing with some wildfires. So keep them in your prayers as well. Not necessarily that they don't lose their stuff. Uh, we need to do our prayer <laughs> study. But that God would protect them and, and give them the opportunity to, to show his grace and light to the world despite what might happen. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Pray for those that family uh anything else nope i think that's it all right till next time till next time